Okay. Yep. Got a quorum. Are we just going to do a quorum and oh, you got your thing. And then your your brief be next. So. Okay. Well, I'll call to order the Harbor Commission work session meeting. Um and Brandy, do you want to do the roll call? Andy Craig. Here. Ryan Schutze. Ken Jones. Here. Pine Krutoff. Krista Hoover. Here. Eric Collins. Here. Tommy Sheridan. Here. All right. We have a quorum and we are postponing our regular business to the next regular meeting and moving right into Collins South Harbor Build Report. Hold on, if you call, use the mic, please. Oh, yeah, okay. Do we have a handheld for, for Ben? Oh, yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Uh, this is the South Harbor report for Tuesday. Uh, we are clipping along pretty well. Um, Still 21 mil spent and no relief from our ad, but we've got a meeting with them next week. And the stated goal from them, along with us, is to they don't leave until we have a resolution on, on the grant proceedings and reimbursements. So it's going slow, but uh, Turnigan and GMC and others have been very gen generous and kind and patient with us, but we'll get there. Uh, as far as the build out goes, obviously you can see where we're at. We've got JKI and part of H built out. We've got about 50% of the road built out. We've got some pile, quite a bit, probably 16 more pile to drive on the roadside and for the approach and uh, finish up H and then start on I. I don't think we're gonna jump right into I just because there's some logistics of having the barge and the material barge and it's just too wide to have all those things working at once. So um, we'll still, we're still on schedule for you know everything in place by mid to late June with full capacity. But we've got some issues with the mud on the shoreline. It's not holding the piles to the capacity we need. So it's not a deal breaker. We just need some more piles. So they're supposed to get to a certain rating, 300,000 pounds per square inch, something like that. And they got to, actually it's 460, but we got to four, we need to get to 460. And so we need some more pile. We need to drive about 30 feet of more H beam and more round pile. So we got to get that shipped up. So it's not ideal. It's going to slow things down with the drive down, but as far as capacity goes for the boats, we're in pretty good shape. We're anticipating Monday, Tony's going to start making calls and start moving people out of the North Harbor and putting people into J and K. So that's good. So it'll alleviate some of the pressure on the North Harbor and get people moving in there. So uh, with that, once we get a good feel for that and I gets done as far as all the cabling gets run in I, then we'll start moving boats into I and then H and then G as it goes along. So still have access to quite a bit of dock space and then we'll start working on putting, uh, putting A and B back together. So not ideal, but you know, this is where we're at. Um, from there, as soon as we get that pile, we'll drive out the pile and finish up the cap and finish up the approach. And then they'll continue on with G and the drive down. So, so that's where we're at. Um, I don't anticipate it being a huge, huge inconvenience. I think the one major issue that I see is not so much capacity for boats. Uh, it's going to be traffic. So getting people through a construction zone safely to work while we're working. So we're working on traffic plan for that. And uh, like I said, Monday, we're going to start making calls out uh, to get boats in there. Serves is definitely on the schedule, and we should have all the boats uh, accommodated in the mini barges and all those things for serves. And that starts the 30th. I think on water. There's on classroom. Water, I think is the first day. Yeah, the classroom starts the 27th, and the 30th are going to start um, on water stuff. So we should be okay with that. No, no anticipated problems with getting serves boats in. And then by the opener, we should have H built out with enough wire and plumbing and all that stuff so that we can start using H as well. So, you know, it's not ideal, but that's where we're at. So still relatively on schedule and still on budget. So today, um, that's all I have for an update besides the electrical. So I've got time for questions before, during, or after. Anyone? Got some questions behind you? Yes. Yeah. Hello. You mentioned uh, I would be next for populating to the cable front. Do you have any ballpark ideas? They're running cable right now. Okay. So it could be quick. 
Um, and would you leave it temporarily hooked up to the main port? Like yeah, that's, right. a, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, you won't have to row your, your skiff to it or anything like that. We're going to have temporary. So, so I will, I and H will be connected to J and K. So, okay. but right now it's, it's a mess. There's deck boards up and, and we could tie boats up to I, but right. it's just not safe to walk around there and they're running so much cable. It's just not practical for, you know, people to be in right. the way and, and, you know, boat owners and, you know, construction. There's, there's no like, projection on my population. You know, just a guess, I would yeah. say 10 days from now, oh, okay. yeah. you know, That's soon, true. sooner than, Perfect. you know, so yeah. Okay. So like I said, we're still like relatively on schedule, but you know, the weather delay and starting late certainly is starting to eat right. into our schedule, but we have space and we're moving people in as fast as we can. So, uh -huh. and everyone's just got to be patient and reasonably flexible with yeah. what we got. So um, yeah, by and large doing well, but you know, big construction project. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Okay. And with that, I'm going to introduce Ben Haight from Ike from uh, Respect Electrical. He is the expert on all things tying up boats and harbors and making things safe and according to code. So uh, with that, Ben, the floor is yours. Thanks, Colin. So good evening. I think we've got a we've got a slight presentation to to work our way through. Um, I just turned it down. I think it's an electrical problem. batteries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear me now. Yeah. So, this is an electrical show. We didn't bring any pillows, but we have coffee. Say, keep you awake. I have a I have a slideshow presentation and what we're going to talk about and what our primary interest is, uh, the electrical systems in the harbor, the new electrical systems that now include protection for ground current, or sometimes we call them stray current. Let's um, somehow we're gonna tap through this. There we go. So with um, code revisions over the past few years, uh, we are now required to, to install circuit protection that will trip the circuit breakers when ground currents exceed certain amounts. That's what we're going to talk about. With the renovation of this harbor, we're including that. This has been going on for a number of years now. It's finally caught up to us here in Cordova. As Colin said, I'm an electrical engineer. I've I work for Respec, who is an engineering firm with offices throughout the state. Um, I came up here in 1975 to work for the Coast Guard. And in 1980, I started my own firm with a, my main focus being on shoreside facilities. So I've done quite a lot of harbor and docks and fish plants and hatcheries a lot of work in, in this environment, including here in Cordoba. I'm based out of uh, Juneau, been there since 1975. So here, of course, you see Cordova, and this is a pedestal similar to what you'll be seeing here. In fact, I think they have one installed down here now on one of the floats. Okay, so today's topics, I'm gonna run through them. What is ground current? What causes ground current? Why is ground current a problem? And how long has ground current existed in our harbors? Where does current, ground current exist? And how, how do the codes address ground current? How do we resolve the ground current problem? We're gonna go through all of these. But first, I think what I would like to do is give you a little a little uh, YouTube video. This is, uh, this is a guy that does this does training quite often, but he's going to talk talk specifically about um, marina, marinas, ground currents, harbors, that type of thing. Let's see if it'll work.
GFCI, wait, GFPE and GFCI protection. Receptacles installed in accordance with 55530A, that's the short power outlets, can have individual ground fault protection set to open at current not more than 30 milliampers. I have a picture, don't have it. So in the short power outlet, I like to get a picture of a short power outlet right here. You, you have a breaker, and you get a picture of a breaker and a receptacle. So if you open, get the short power outlet and a little pedestal, and you open it up, you're going to see that there's going to be a 50 amp breaker, and there's going to be a 20 amp breaker, and there's going to be a twist lock 50 amp receptacle, and there's going to be a 20 amp receptacle. And then, okay, well, the 50 amp receptacle has a 50 amp breaker, but that breaker is going to be a ground fault protector set at 30 milliampers. So that, and then the, the, the 20 amp, 125 volt, 120 volt, 125 volt receptacle is being supplied by a GFCI set at 5 milliampers. So when I get my boat and I plug it in shore power, I'm having 30 milliampers of ground fault protection of equipment. It can't be 5 milliampers, it can't be GFCI because it more than likely won't hold. So 30 milliampers is going to be the maximum level that you can set that protection. And if there's any kind of failure in your boat, the boat is in the water and it has a shaft and a rudder and propellers, and there's a fault inside the electrical system, and you lost the effective ground fault current path coming to the boat itself, well, the leakage, not the leakage, the actual the ground fault current will be limited to the water current path. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a fault, but it will go more than 30 milliampers, and it will trip that ground fault protection equipment, right? Now, I was looking for that picture. That's not what I want to look like. Yeah. And you notice the buttons on these are orange and your GFPEs are usually not white. Right. There you go. And a 50 and a 30. In this that one has a 50 and a 30. No. Okay. Yep. okay, now the feeder. Remember we talked about that pedestal? Probably need to get a picture of a pedestal, Brian. I don't have a picture here. I don't have a picture. We have a picture of a pedestal and I'm running a feeder, a 200 amp feeder out to that pedestal that could supply four or both or 100 amp feeder, well, that the short power breaker for the receptacle is set at 30 milliampers, but the feeder that runs out to the short power, that's set at 100 milliamps. So that way, in case it was a fault in the feeder somehow, and the feeder did not clear the fault, well, then it's going to trip the feeder ground fault protection of equipment. But it's set at 100 milliampers, thinking that, well, if you had four short power receptacles on that, each limited to 30 milliampers, that we probably won't have all of them having leakage to that value. And, it, and then, therefore, the ground fault protection of equipment on the feeder will open when there actually is a fault on the feeder and not likely to open on any of the short power outlets unless possibly, and I don't know how this works out, uh, where if you have a fault on a boat and it's more than 30 milliampers or more than 100 milliampers, and then you have both two ground fault protectors, right, connected together, will the 100 milliampere open after the 30 milliampere? What's the selected coordination on that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, maybe the 100 milliampere is a trip to 30,000. Well, probably at that level. I don't know which one would trip first. But it's going to go to 100, but that, is that 31 trip first? I don't know. What matters is this. The feeder has 100 milliampere ground fault protection equipment set. The receptacle has 30 milliampere ground fault protection set at the short power pedestal, short power outlet, and that provides the protection. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> there was a new rule brought in the 2020 code, which makes absolutely no sense at all. And here's what they said. Say, so, listen, you know, if you put three or more receptacles, for short power to boats. We are three or more receptacles supply short power to boats. A leakage current measurement device shall be available and be used to determine leakage current from each boat that will utilize short power. The same. You need to provide this anytime you have more than three short power receptacle outlets. And what this is, Brian, this is just an F here, except it has a setting. Very high resolution the computer. Yeah. It sits over Low here. Range. It's an MA. The yeah. range goes from amps. You just click it down to MA, which is milliampers. 
and 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 you know because everything has a, a range that it works from. This works. This works plus or what's this sense? What, oh, this is this is hurt. Not worried about that. Where's my uh, current? Where's my range of my current? Right there on the uh, top right. Looking for your accuracy or your yeah 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 like my accuracy accuracy is the next next down oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, right there oh plus or oh, oh plus or minus what CT what CT counts and whatever range you're in so what what is that one oh 60 hertz oh 50 60 hertz yeah but that's accuracy and hertz I'm talking about the accuracy and the I don't think it's shown I don't think I'm oh AC current it's the next one down accuracy. One or two percent, right? Yeah. So if you had this thing set to 100 amps, well, 1.2 percent is going to give you 1.2 amps. Well, if I can't measure, I can't measure, you know, milliampers. But I have to set it down. Oh, hey, here it is. The accuracy down here. Whatever it is. I can't see. I think I'm missing some information down below down here. This will measure milliampers. You can't take a regular ammeter and set it at a 200 amp range, and then it has a 1% accuracy, and now you're at 200 amps. Well, then you need to set this in, into the milliamp range at 1 or 2%. Well, yeah, now that, that's going to pick it up. So now let's think about this. Go back here. I run a feeder, 100 milliamp your ground fault protection of equipment. I put in a pedestal, I put breakers, I put 30 milliamp protection, and I have it all worked out. Let's just say that we had four shore fire outlets, and each one had 27 amperes of leakage of the four. Well, four times 27 comes out to be under 108 amp milliamps. Mm -hmm. Well, since it's 27 amperes each, well, that's not a problem because none of those four breakers are going to trip. But because the cumulative total of the four equal more than 100 milliamps, the feeder drops them all out. The theory of this feeder is like, wow, man, if the feeder dropped out, we got to find out which of these guys are the problem. Well, none of them are the problem because none of them was more than 30 milliamps. It's just that they all added up. Because if any one was more than 30 milliamps, it would have taken out the 30 milliamp protection device. So having a leakage current detector that set an ammeter set at a very low range, measuring these things, but none of them that are more than 30 milliampers becomes irrelevant. There's nothing you can do about that. Not only that, but if you did determine, well, this one's 27 and this one is 18, well, then we want to move you all. Are you actually going to be moving these boats all over the place? Because they're all within operating within 30 milliampers. And so there's a problem. And in, in to me, in that the code is requiring a leakage measurement detector, what really won't matter because if it's tripping, because it's more than 30 milliampers, well, I already know which one's the one that's open. Right. And why are you requiring somebody to have a tool? And it goes on the information or note about what it's trying to do. But this is an overreaction of the code panel because people are terrified of people getting killed in the water, saying, let's get a recording, or let's get something that can measure these things. Let's find out which is the guy that's the problem. Well, you can find out which is the guy that's the problem. Just plug them in. Turn off all four receptors, right? Turn one at a time. They trip you. No, turn the other one. No, turn it off. No, no. Okay, so none of the boats is the problem. Turn them all on. Well, now it trips 100 million. More than one boat is the problem. Yeah. So here's a beautiful thing. You know, we live in a capitalist country. And I knew when this came out, you remember me saying this. I said, you wait, somebody's going to come out with something. And I'm like, you know, it's been like six months since we've talked about this. Let me see if somebody came out with something. What? And lo and behold, we now have a marina ground fault control panel. Multi-channel marina ground fault control panel where you put CPs on the individual outlets. And it's got a little computer and a ground fault detector and a reset button and an alarm and the whole nine yards. You can have this uh, GFPE on the feeder, and you can have GFPE on the individual channels. And I'll identify which one's had a problem. And you probably can get a nice pretty screen. And you oh, it's got a little screen on The boat layout, the whole thing in the book layout. <laughs> I don't see that on this one, but I'm sure they have. I would want it. I want to show which boat. I want to show yeah. it red. 
and yellow. And it will green. illuminate the LED pilot light and interrupt the circuit. I mean, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, it's getting there. All right, let's move on. I think we got just a little little snippet of what we got to talk about. So this uh this I'm going to talk about where how how this current circulates in our system and where it escapes the system and gets into the water and affects us. Uh, I want to talk about the pedestals and the design of the of the harbor a little bit so we understand where the problem is. This last issue that he was talking about is is definitely a problem that we have to deal with um, and I'll talk about how we deal with it without without going to this high-end computer technology. Let's hit the next one. Here's, this is a, a representation, a very simplified representation of a, of a harbor system. So we've got, we've got the, the utility transformer on the left. And what he was talking about is the feeder circuit breaker, which is set to trip um, any ground currents exceeding 100 milliamps. But you can see it's also feeding several several different shore power uh, short tie receptacles which are set for 30 milliamps now if you have what he was talking about if you have more than three uh, receptacles on a on a feeder it's possible that you could have four leaky boats not likely though but it's possible you could have four leaky boats that will trip the main we're gonna we're gonna deal with that let's hit the next one so on a boat, this is just kind of a very simplified version of what you'll see on a boat. You've got your you've got heaters and battery chargers and and lights, all all drawing electricity. Some all of them require grounding in some form, and that's where we where we have to be careful about how we circuit the boats. Let's hit the next one. Again, a simplified version. This is what we were just looking at. These two two uh, schemes here. And next, this is uh, just a quick uh, visual of the pedestal. This is very similar to what we are getting down here in the harbor. Now he was talking about uh, two receptacles in the, in the pedestals. The two that we have going in, or in some, in some cases we have three, but the predominance is all of them have the 30 amp, 120 volt receptacle for shore power. Most, a lot of the boats, that's all they use. The larger stalls have the 50 amp, 208 volt receptacles. And those are also set to trip at 30 milliamps. What Mike Holt was talking about was a 20 amp receptacle that we don't have in our, in our pedestals. And those are for for maintenance purposes, they're not for shore power. And those are set for five milliamps, but we don't have those. Those are purely, the harbor might have some, but we don't We don't have them for, for the boats. Okay, so there are two primary sources that we have to be concerned with for, for that will cause ground current. That's the first one. So boat wiring configurations. Usually that's where our biggest problem is in another one. So what we will find, I've got three different conditions here that are very typical. One is, a, is where the ground and the neutral conductors are bonded together on the boat. If that's the case, then it's very possible we'll get, we'll get a ground current and it will trip the circuit breaker. The other is, um, on some of the older boats, they used to be wired similar to a car, where the where the frame of the engine frame and the transmission and gearbox and all of that was used as the as the negative side. Well, that that with certain chargers, that would be a direct path into the water, and cause caused a lot of problems. And then the third one in this category, and this is particularly for boats that have generators, the larger, larger boats that have generators, oftentimes they will have their neutral bonded to ground, which they need to do, 
but it's the neutral is tight is a solid connection to shore when they when they connect in, and that creates a circulating current into the water. Okay, one more here. So the other fault condition is feeders that might fault, and this doesn't. I mean, it affects the boats in some manner because the boats become a, a, a path for a return path for ground conductor or ground current. <clears throat> but it is um, it is where cables are chaf chafing on in the on the floats and they're in the water, things like that, where it might cause some ground current, a leakage. Let's go to the next one. This is really hard to see. So what I'm what this what we're trying to illustrate here is is the under normal conditions the current is flowing to the receptacle and to the to the loads on the boat heaters lights battery chargers that type of thing. Let's go to the next one. Hopefully I can see it. So this is how this is a this is more of a visual of how the ground fault current relay works within the circuit breaker. So it's looking at the summation of the current that's going to up front on the hot wires and totaling that with the, the current that's coming back on the neutral wire. It's just looking at that. If, if that value in normal cases is zero and everything is great, but if the value changes, then it means that there's some leakage somewhere. And, and and you'll have a positive value and it will trip. Let's hit the next one. So this is just a, a quick uh, example of what, what could happen. So if the battery charger is connected, uh, the ground, the, new, the negative side is connected into ground, it will show a leakage going through the, through into the water and coming up in the ground rod to the transformer, which, then we'll trip the circuit breakers. That's kind of hard to read. And this is really just talking about the same thing. It's a, it's a, when, when, when this happens, then the summation of the hot, hot lead and the negative lead is no longer zero and it will trip the circuit breaker. Let's hit the next one. So this is just saying the same thing. You can see the illustration. If, if that current is coming through the water up into the transformer, it's bypassing the neutral and tripping. Try again. Okay, this is, this is another, another condition. Now, our, our, all of our circuits down here in the harbor, New Harbor, will have a ground current or ground conductor. The green conductor is a ground conductor. It is not. It is not used to measure the, the current to the ground fault relay. But if the ground, if there's a connection into the water, it will. The current in the water will parallel the current that's in that ground conductor, and it'll still trip the the circuit breaker. Let's try another one. I'm kind of repetitive on a number of things, so you know, if, if questions come up, just let's just. Fire them out, yeah. So I just want to make sure. So when you're talking about that grounding rod, there's going to be a grounding rod in the wire every four volts. So I'm just trying to understand it in my mind. There, there are there will be a number of ground rods going into the water to to capture that current, so that with the idea that it's it's shortening the circuit and affecting just that area. Rather than the whole harbor, so it's like maybe like every four boats or ten boats. I think it's about every hundred feet, hundred or two hundred, something in that range. I okay. don't remember. We have it on the drawings, and I can't remember what it is. Okay, just like kind of yeah, yeah. So this this is a this is that other condition where where we're affecting the feeder circuit breaker, and this is where we would have a fault on the cable. And that should not affect the pedestal breakers, but it will affect the one in the in the main distribution panel. 
And this is, this is illustrating that in more detail, that it's showing the fault going into the water and back up and it will trip. Okay. Now, and this is why is current ground current a problem? This is one factor that we have to deal with. When the ground current exceeds these different amounts, you get different effects. The ones that we're mostly concerned with is, is the 15 to 30, or excuse me, anything exceeding five milliamps, it's gonna cause, um, it's gonna cause you to lose muscle control. So if you're in the water and, and you hit something greater than five milliamps, you might not be able to swim. Let's hit the next one. And of course, that's that was the drowning. This is something that I was talking about a little bit earlier. This is uh, explaining why uh, current in the water is a problem. So current flowing through, first of all, salt water is more conductive than, than fresh water. Fresh water is where we have the problem. So you put, you figure this out, and this is an electrical um, diagram showing that the resistance of water is one number and the resistance of the human body is another. So where you, if you're in salt water, it's more conductive, which means less resistance, and the current is most likely to flow through the water rather than the body. But if it's fresh water, the resistance in the, in the water is much higher and the body is, is much lower relatively relative to the water. So you're gonna get more current through the body. And that's why we have more freshwater deaths and, and shocks. Now this, you would think that, well, our harbors are salt water, but we have an intrusion of freshwater, which is a, creates a lens, oftentimes creates a lens on top, which is all freshwater. So we have to maintain that concern as well. All right. So how long have we been dealing with this? As long as we've had electricity in the harbors. Harbors were, as I, I started doing this in 1980 and I was seeing, we were just starting to get into the second version at that time. So I, I've seen harbors starting to be electrified in the mid fifties. So we've had this problem since that time. This is, uh, this is our harbor here, and it's kind of hard to see, but what I wanted to illustrate here is, is uh, where we have our circuit protection. So of course, each pedestal will have its own circuit breakers and with ground fault relays, they're all set for 30 milliamps. But at the head of each of the main floats is a substation. And the substation is there with a transformer and a, distrib a, a large distribution panel. The distribution panel provides the feeders going out to the pedestals. Um, and I'm shooting a little bit from memory, but typically with pedestals that only have the 30, the, the 30 amp receptacles, they could have as many as 12 short ties on a feeder. So this kind of, this kind of brings up that issue of, of what, how, what happens with the main feeder breaker. Each one of these feeders has its own ground fault protection. The feeders that have, the pedestals that have the 208 50 amp receptacles, it's a maximum of six pedestals, six short ties, not pedestals, but short ties per feeder. So in all cases, or in most, almost all cases, there's a potential for tripping the feeder. Now the, the feeder, um, these are 208, the power brought, uh, that's bring, being brought down into the harbor, down to those substations, is 480. So that circuit also has uh, circuit protection. It also has a ground fault relay. So we have multiple ground fault relays all through this. So how do the codes address the ground current? This is, let's bring the next one up. This is just... This is, what we re, this is what we have to abide by with the code. This is Article 555 in, in the National Electrical Code. 
And this just talks about where we have to, where we have to comply with, with these codes. Let's go to the next one. And this talks about the ground, the required ground fault protection. Uh, so feeders re are required to be 100, 100 milliamps max, and the shore power is required to be 30, 30 milliamps max. Let's go to the next one. This is I pulled this out of the out of the code, and it talks about each of these specifically. Let's go to the next one. So how do we resolve it? Let's hit the next. So we put the we have the installation of of current sensors and protective relays. Next, and the relays will be sensing the current on the feeders and opening the circuit breakers on the feeders when it exceeds 100 milliamps. Next, and then each each shore power receptacle will trip at 30 milliamps. Solution is to is to upgrade the boat. Boats ensure that the wiring on the boats uh, is is such that we don't have a ground current. Yeah, these are the three examples that I talked about earlier. So if the if the ground is is tied into the neutral on the boat, that will create a problem. What happens is the current coming through the load on the boat will get split between the, the neutral conductor and the ground conductor, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a positive value on the ground fault relay, and it'll trip. Let's go to the next one. This is the one I talked about. And, and just, to, just to point out here, we keep, we're, keep, we're showing the, the ground conductor, the green conductor separate from the white conductor, which is the neutral. And that's what we should have on the boat. But we're showing that on oops, we're showing that in those instances where a battery charger where the, the neutral conductor is connected through to the negative side of the of the battery and the battery is connected to to ground, then we'll have a ground current. This is an instance where a boat with uh, with a generator and they're solidly connected to to feed one or the other. In this instance, the the ground, the, the neutral conductor on the on the generator should be bonded to ground for for the safety on the boat. However, the problem it, uh, comes about in that it ties into the ground on shore. The resolution to that with mo that most boats are adopting is disconnecting the, the neutral when you're on shore power disconnecting the neutral from the generator. And then that, that will prevent, prevent that circulating current. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so I wanna come back to this, this whole issue of, of uh, the coordinate, what we call the coordination of our relays. So we've talked about the, the 30 milliamp protected relays on the, on the pedestals. In my testing, I found that those generally trip in about 80 milliseconds, generally. The relays that we put in the, in the, um, on the feeders, we can set the delays out there way much longer. So if there's a, a, a short-term current occurring, which is usually the case, the feeder's just gonna walk right through it. You won't see it. That's one of the solutions that we've used I'm not sure if I even want to talk about the other one. <laughs> With the other ones, the relays that we've been putting in are adjustable. And if we continue to have problems, we're just going to have to, we're just going to, have to jack them up. They, we can't abide by 100 milliamp rule if we, if we can. We'll do it if we can. But if it just causes us problems, then we're just going to have to bring it up. You don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's recorded. <laughs> show us how to do it. Yeah. yeah. Don't show her. <laughs> so that was, that was a quick run through. So now you're not going to be able to test with the uh, your, your ground and your common. You're testing the meter. That's the only choice. Oh, you're not going to see that. 
this this meter we can we can it, once you connect in we can see if you've got a ground current so uh, the way this is set up um tony has these these made up so that you can see we've got the green wire so we're going to wrap this he has the tester with the milliamp um, uh, capability so he just takes and hooks that around there and he can see if you've got a ground current. The other way to test it is you can check check that, but that doesn't that doesn't tell you doesn't tell us what's in the water. This will. And then I, I've also told him that we could do this, and and that will also help me learn what's going on in the water. When we go out of all of them, it'll it'll be equal, right? But then, then that's the reason we separate the, the ground. So you, all, of, all of these, all of these will be equal. Yeah, all of these will be equal. But then, if you, and this should, and you're ground, right. Yeah, you, you should. Neutral, then. Yeah, if everything is exactly. correct, this should be zero. Also. Yeah. And, and, um, I guess another question on that same point is, like, if somebody takes a, a, a household washer and dryer and puts it on the boat, right? Because that ground is. Too neutral there. You're supposed to take off that ground, and if it's on a boat, the, the house have have the ground and then move together to hold the rain. And then it seems like you have to take that they're off. They're not supposed that. to do that anymore. I've run into that before, and they're not supposed to do that. They're they're supposed to remain isolated. The ground is there to to connect to be bonded to the enclosure that your refrigerator is, so that if something should fail. Or fault within the within the refrigerator, then it will go to ground and trip your circuit breaker. But it's they're supposed to be isolated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if you've got one that's bonded in there, then you might be right, but it's not it's not adding safety to your refrigerator. So I'm um, just. Just on, on that, on the one that says every boat needs to be tested every year. Um, I've tested these boats before, and of course, in the class. And um, boy, I mean, it's a nightmare. I mean, we just did like 10 boats. And, you know, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's going to be interesting when it actually comes to. Yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a big learning experience here. Well, somebody's gonna have to full time. I mean, uh, I mean, troubleshooting. You're ben next. and I are gonna do them all tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> line them up. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, Colin. Antonio, I put you guys on the spot. What does it look like for your typical owner operator on the boat if the new harbor show up? If the new float has ten hours on. What's the process going to look like? They're going to pick up a phone and say, hey, Tony, get on down here with your magic wires. It, test it, our boat. And then based on your experience, Ben, like, what does that look like? What are, you know, I know you have on problems, but like, how is that going to look? You're going to find your problems. Your gear's going to tell you that ground or whatever. Then what do you do? So one of the, this is, uh, you know, we've we've gone through this at the other harbors and, and it, it's, there's a there's a bit of a strategy that goes with that, but um, one of the first thing is that we're not going to be able to test you at your new at your new shore tie, because if you if you have a, an excessive ground current, you're just going to trip the circuit breaker, so we won't be able to test it. So we're going to have to set up something someplace where we don't have ground fault In protection. Ground. No. Yeah, so we'll have to you know have to have a test test location just to do that. A hot. A hot a hot pedestal dock spot or yeah. something a hot yeah. flip we yeah have that. yeah we did <laughs> they have a couple of them <laughs> and intentionally so, but... that, I mean, so isolation transformer will isolate before that will, will that you have that isolation transform will it will it not trip the breaker if you have a problem or it will still it breaker? won't yeah so with an isolate a true isolation transformer it keeps your grounding completely separate. Your your your, your grounding is on, is from the secondary side of the of the transformer, and 
So that keeps you isolated with, within just your boat. So if, you, if you've got a ground crack, you're going to create problems just for yourself. So for you, taps the same good size. Yeah. And I know there's this yeah. galvanic isolator, which is a lot cheaper, but that I don't quite understand that. Put some kind of voltage back in the thing, and it seems like a, a cheap way to go, but then is it real? Oh, I don't, I think you're, you're just fooling yourself with that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, they're expensive. Yeah. Yeah. They're expensive. And we try to, try to, try to find the problem before we go to that solution. Is it's just not only expensive, but it adds, takes up space on the boat. Larger boats, it's kind of no yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You can test over in the North Harbor. Yeah, really can. Yeah, yeah. we don't have those up there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So on that topic of isolation transformers, I guess are we keeping? <clears throat> Like shore power about the same way it is now with like somewhere in the 40 foot stall range under that's gonna be 30 amp 120 above that's gonna be 208. Do we like we didn't really I mean that's typically what I see, but I know there are some like 40 foot seniors that depending on their slip or which harbor you're in, they'll still just have a 30 amp 120. Um but then everything generally 50 foot plus is 208. I mean, I can't remember where, yeah, I can't yeah, remember where our break so is. We didn't change from what we had in the harbor. Yeah. In place. Okay. I wasn't sure. And then the other thing I was going to ask is we have to go isolation transformers, especially on a, I mean, on some of these larger bolts that are 208. Um, I guess the inrush current is a concern. And as far as powering them up, if what what should could there be like soft starters you shouldn't, involved, or do you generally not see that as an issue? I have not run into that as a, as an issue, and it's generally uh, uh, dependent on the size of your of the transformer. If you yeah. if you have a really large one that's really exceeding the the value of the circuit protection, then you might get some inrush. The other part is the other way to prevent inrush is, is uh, disconnect the loads on the secondary side when you plug it in. Oh, be ideal either way. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of like the 30 amp 121s, which aren't that crazy expensive for like the Victron units and stuff like that. Yeah. But then they're European, so once you step up 50 amp to the way, they don't really make anything. Yeah. And they'll put a little soft start in there. I mean, I don't know. I know I know a lot of people have been able to put soft starts on their boats, but I don't know how many times they have to put the breakers for it. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Some people would be willing to do that. Yeah. 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 It, it, I think that's a kind of a personal, personal thing, too. Um, the more you add, the more you get to maintain. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's, I mean, all the large steel bolts I've seen because tenders and stuff, they all get worked on by factory electricians from the plants. And I don't think I've seen one that has neutral and ground wired right yet. Yeah. You, 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 one of my first projects was, uh, in Juno, we, we were doing a ground current analysis. And walking through the harbor and checking all the boats, and I found this one boat that had ground current. We turned, we were going down the down the float, got down a little bit farther, found another one. The two boats were identical, and they're brand new boats. So yeah, you're right. They they still don't know how to wire them correctly. Well, I mean, um, I almost noticed it when like the. Uh... The process for plants on land when their electricians come in and then they don't keep their grounds and neutral separate because they use whatever water they have laying around the tank, yeah. but they're separately filled plus get them fish. Get them going. Yeah. 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 I hear you. Yeah, Colin. So, Ben, uh, you recommend, or what do you recommend? We get everything dialed in, not go high school power, all that good stuff. And 
or operator comes in, plugs in, no problems, no need to test, just go about your business. Full yeah. Service. Test anyway, or I, I would test anyway, just yeah. just to know. Yeah. Well, at least at least before before the initial uh, um, connection, at least do that. Whether you do them annually or not, um, I guess that's kind of a policy we have to work on. Um, see what see what happens here. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I think that's everybody's going to be, you know, if you're if you're modifying your boat or doing anything with it, then maybe you should come in and get another test, just so you know. When we've done these before, we've kept records of what kind of what the what what the readings were with our tests, so we could we could maintain a base of of what the boat is and what it's contributing. And particularly you know, this issue where we've got multiple, multiple boats on, on a feeder, it's nice to know what, what we're dealing with if, if we're going to blow a feeder or give us problems on a feeder. We don't want to trip those feeders. Because if, if you trip a feeder, you're affecting more than one boat. And we don't know about that. We don't know, you know, boat owners don't know that they're that they're tripped off. Yeah. Mr. Tripponi, if we, we do have a ground fault problem, which I do, when they break, blow the breakers when I plug into Valdez and Harbor and Vineyard. Are there people available to help troubleshoot the boat system or are we just kind of? I am told there is. I was talking to a quote about outboard the other day. And they told me there are people, at least a couple in town, that are ready to start going around troubleshooting. So maybe you got to talk to Ryan over there, but he did tell me there was people that wanted to start doing this. So. I'm probably one of them. Okay. Okay. So, but yeah. One thing I'm going to say is if you have faults, you just go start break, cutting off breakers, refrigerator, and things. Yeah. And then if it goes away, it's that. That's the simple way to do it. Just, yeah. Start shutting off things. And if it goes off, that's something. Yeah. Remember, right? It didn't. We only went home for two years. It's been a while since we. Yes. So, in the news, I think this is for Tony probably. In the old days, you used to call CEC and they turn on the power, so now it'll be regulated through you, like you need a okay or something. They're, I mean, they control all the power, so I mean, their account they set up if they go up and turn it on, say you're good to go, and the trips when you plug in, then I can come down and at least let you know whether you have the problem or it's something else. Oh, I see. Yeah, but when it gets into like troubleshooting all that and everything, then you know, but yeah. Yeah, troubleshoot there. You have to go. Yes. Yeah, we'd have to go to. Yeah, right. So, what uh, is there going to be any, any other regulations in force? Well, I mean, there's no right now. We're not. So, if you're popping breakers, it's <laughs> self regulating. Self regulating. <laughs> but uh, but no other. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different harbors in the U.S. Yeah. I don't I, electrically. I don't see any other any other issues that we nothing nothing that's changed really. This should work even better than it should work better. It will work better than what we've had. It definitely worked better. It will definitely work better. We expect the harbor to come online. We're talking about the end of June. The power, yeah, power and everything. This we're talking June. Everything. That's yeah. the plan right now. Yes. I've got a <clears throat> yeah question. So um, Mr. Dranka, he uh, mentioned Valdez. And so I'm just curious if, you know, if your boat works in the new Valdez Harbor, will it work in our new Harbor? It will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're, everybody's going by the same rules. And that's what the, I understand, you have one of those isolations? I think yeah. I do. I've, I, Eldon would probably know more than I do. Oh, you have the galvanic isolator. I've not seen. Okay. I'm not seeing that on your boat. No. Okay. I think, yeah, I think you just have the galvanic isolator that does the ground. Oh, like uh, you have harbors. Are they set up this way? 
I, you know, I haven't, I haven't are, looked at see what Kodiak has going on right now. Uh, they should. The heart is still pretty old, though. It is getting. It is I getting mean, old. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Well, it's been a couple of different. I remember when we last worked there. It's been a while back. Yeah, I. I don't know. Any? I think. Any other questions? Okay, so most of those are the, the are set up that way with uh, ground fault protection. The Crescent Harbor was recently about three or four years ago was was rebuilt, um, and that had most of that has all new ground fault protection. I uh, believe um, A and B Hall A and B Harbor is also upgraded. I don't remember about the other the other two. Yeah, I don't think the Elias and Harbor was upgraded yet. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's pretty old. Yeah. Anything else? I really appreciate you being here and asking questions. Yeah. More alarm. Yeah. <laughs> and and feel, feel free to contact me if you have more questions. I'm I'm happy to jump back into this. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. And uh, appreciate your patience. Thanks for coming to the harbor. We will get there. So, I got just a question for people up here. In the old harbor, and you're moving to the new harbor, Tony can come down and check beforehand if you think there might be a problem, and it'll save you having to move back and forth. That would, that would be a good idea to, to check them before you move. Yeah. Yeah, make life much You're currently easier. plugged in, and everything's working. Do it now. Yeah, do it now. Yeah, Sun early. Yeah, <laughs> early Sunday mornings. He doesn't like to start. Oh, I don't think I'm going to have a problem with either of my boats. Yeah. Both plugged into that.